So hi, my name is Dr. Stephanie Edwards. I am the executive director of the Boston Theological Interreligious Consortium. If I haven't met you yet, I hope to meet you soon. Um, I am so excited to welcome our last speaker of our BTI Talks virtual events this year, Yazid Kamaldian. He is a journalist and a master's student at Hartford International University, the newly renamed. Um, and we are so excited to have him to talk about religion and reporting, faith and facts. It's something that I know being a, an American citizen the last two years has been an incredibly formative and somewhat strife ridden um, conversation. Um, but it is also one that I think um, has a lot of potential for us as people interested in religion and interested in religion in public life. So we are recording this session today and we will post it on our YouTube channel for um, hopefully re-watching and sharing through your networks. And um, with that, I will pass it to Yazid and I'm so excited to hear from you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Stephanie, for inviting me to be part of the BTI Talks and what an honor to be closing the season of talks for um, your, uh, your series. Um, and yes, I relate to what you're talking about, um, the strife aspect. I mean, just this week we have seen again in the US, the confluence of religion and politics with the right to access of abortion, making the news again. And this is really an opportunity for journalists to dig into the religious component of society, where politics and religion meet. But I'm going to leave that for now and go into the presentation. I'm going to share my screen. Um, I do have a couple of photos and slides that will show, you know, what I've been up to in my journalism career. So I guess what I need to do first is share screen. And then I, I do that. And then I go view. I want to view this full screen. So it's going to be a slideshow while I'm talking. So you don't just have to look at my face the whole time. <laughs> so yeah, um, welcome to the talk or the presentation, Faith and Facts, Reflections on Religion Reporting by myself, Yazid Kamaldi. So I was born in Cape Town, South Africa, just a brief introduction of who I am. And that's why I completed my degree in journalism. I'm presently wrapping up my master's degree in international peace building at the Hartford International University for religion and peace, and that is here in Hartford, Connecticut. So during my journalism career, I've lived and worked in a number of countries, and this includes conflict zones as well, such as Yemen, Sudan, the Gaza Strip, and Syria. Um, and now I'm just going to look at what's happening over here, because I was hoping the pictures would come up as well. I guess I need to do view. I'm not sure why it's not showing up as a slideshow. Okay, there we go. So I just wanted to share some of the pictures from my um, my uh, journalism career. So this is some images from the time when I went to the Gaza Strip. And so I've done, like I said, quite a bit of conflict reporting. And that led me, of course, to, you know, the uh, HIU, the Hartford International University, because I was interested in peace, the expanding the conversation as a journalist, especially expanding the conversation and understanding how to move through conflict. Stephanie, is the picture showing up okay on your side? Yeah, thank you. So um, just so these are gonna be some pictures from, from Gaza that I'm going to show. Um, and of course, you know, this is again, another example of the meeting place of religion and politics and conflict, unfortunately, that we see ongoing. Um, and then I'm also part of an organization called the In International Association for Religion Journalists. And I'm actually a founding member of that association, and it aims to promote fair and ethical reporting on religion. And this is just an article that I did on Interfaith Dialogue, specifically focusing on something called GEDIS, which is the Global Exchange on Religion and Society. It's currently ongoing. A part of it is a two-year program funded by the European Union, and we traveled to Atlanta, Georgia, where we focused on what it's like being a minority. And this website, it's theiarj.org, theiarj.org. There's another slide with the address on there somewhere. I'm sure I think it's, yeah, I've included it. But essentially, there's a bunch of resources on the website. So anybody interested in understanding or learning more about how 
to not only report on religion, you can see as part of the slide is at the bottom, it says tips for writing compelling religion stories. And you know, there's also primers on different faith groups. So we can begin to get knowledgeable as journalists so that we can, of course, enhance our reporting on religion. So my journey to religion reported started with my first job at a daily newspaper in my birth city, Cape Town, South Africa. The newspaper that I was working for had a series that focused on the different religions and cultures in our city. I come from a very diverse country and a city where people intermarry and, you know, race and all of these things. It's all prevalent and present, even though we have a history in our country of apartheid, which was segregated and well legalized segregation which is a challenge that still exists with us. So the intention of that series at the newspaper was to look at the diversity in our city and talk about the things that we have in common instead of that which sets us apart. Among my assignments was to report on the Greek Orthodox Easter celebrations. It was the first time inside an Orthodox church for me, and it was so beautiful. It was just a beautiful experience, and the rituals were just so intriguing. Uh, another assignment that I had to do as part of the series was to gather what we call vox pops and this is essentially the voice of the people and this is a snapshot of comments from people in response to a question and that was just another way that i was becoming aware of our common ground and our diversity in our own city and this experience stayed with me and i remained interested in exploring different faith spaces through personal journeys and also professional reporting and this is an example of some of the interfaith reporting that I went and I did, um, you know, and this journey, for example, led me to such interesting places. One year I was invited by a Turkish group, and this is in fact part of the Turkish group's efforts. They host interfaith iftars. Now iftar is the meal that Muslims have at the end of the day of fasting during Ramadan. And what was so intriguing for me was that this iftar was being held in the Catholic church. And I'd never done that before. I'd never gone and broken my fast or ended my day of fasting inside a church. So that was super interesting. And I continued staying in touch with them. And as you can see here, you know, it's as the headline reads, Muslims and Christians link hands. And um, it was essentially talking about the interfaith uh, iftar and fam Turkish families or fam Muslim families in Cape Town would invite people of other faith groups to the iftar. And the iftar, in fact, has become quite a symbol of diversity and unity in our city because more and more of these are happening in public spaces during Ramadan and it's really about community more than about faith or religion at this stage. So when I lived in Johannesburg, I continued my religion reporting Now, Johannesburg is the economic capital of South Africa and I wrote a series of articles on the month of fasting, which is Ramadan, for a national daily newspaper that I was working for at the time. And that's another picture of the iftar. I, I can't remember what order I put these pictures in. So something might be popping up. Okay, that's okay. This is going back to my conflict reporting. So this is just some pictures again from Syria. Uh, you know, that was 2015 when I went to Syria. And that's me with my cameras in Syria. Um, yeah, so, and then I did the series of articles for this national daily newspaper. And it was such a personal journey. And the newspaper gave me space to reflect that. And during that month, I'd also traveled to neighboring Mozambique. So I could also reflect on what Ramadan was like in another country. Now, for me, the importance of telling stories about our faith and religious experiences is that we bring into the public space an understanding of these sometimes misunderstood life ways, as we call it. Now, Islam is a minority religion in South Africa. The predominant religion in South Africa is Christianity. More than 90% of South Africans identify as Christian. Now, we know that in Christianity, there are multiple denominations and varying degrees of how people, you know, participate in their faith, likewise with Islam and other faith groups as well. Now, being a minority and, you know, and then coming to America and feeling that I'm a minority as well, you know, with its faith or race, you kind of see the importance of being able to communicate the diversity because a lot of it is about, we need to know each other. We need to know how we live, we need to understand each other. And that's all about social cohesion. And that links directly to my program here at HIU, which is about peace building and how do we coexist. And when we talk about how we are able, we, sorry, when we talk about how we are and how we self-identify in a public space, we're able to open up conversation for others as well, 
then other people can also begin to talk about who they are and how they practice their faith. And we can begin to really then start this interfaith dialogue and bring understanding about in various communities. Now, by sharing our stories, we inform the broader public about the manyness of faiths in our world. And it is an ideal, it is really an ideal, you know, to expect people to accept everything and anyone that they feel challenged by. So, you know, we do understand the work here because people feel, when people feel threatened and when they feel challenged by, you know, that they, at the very core of their identity, you know, that is really the work, for me at least, why this work is important, so that people can feel safe, that they don't feel threatened, that they feel they can know each other. And, you know, and this is just not going to Yemen. So I lived in Yemen for a while as well, and there was a lot of conflict happening there. You know, they wanted the president out. There were protests. There was a lot of violence. So I've seen a fair amount of violence as well. Oh, and this is just when I went to Atlanta to the house of Martin Luther King Jr. I've also been studying these principles of nonviolence this year. Um, you know, so that was a good example of how religion and interfaith work, because he was also working in with other people, people of other faiths, how religion has played a role in bringing about peace and understanding in our society. The main thing for me is through this presentation, I really want to encourage everybody to tell their own story, you know. So with social media such as Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, telling personal stories has become so much easier. We can share text, photos, and videos about our journeys, as well as the faith communities we are part of. Some practical tips to consider when telling your story is to plan out a few key messages. And also remember to ask yourself this one question, why? That's a very important question. Ask yourself, why am I telling the story? Now in journalism, when we train to be journalists, you know, we answer very basic questions and we call it the W's and the H. So H is basically just explaining how something happened. The W's are the primary questions. Just by the way, the slide that you're looking at now, the picture, this is the, uh, the page of the International Association of Religion Journalists. And that's where you can find a whole bunch of resources. You can sign up for the newsletter. It's really a, a tool or a space rather to bring journalists together who want to focus on fair and ethical reporting of religion. So let's come to the W's. So the, the W's are the primary questions. We ask what is happening? where it's happening, when it's happening, who is involved. And of course, the most important one for me at least is why it's happening. I think the why question has always been the most important because it helps us to find an angle to telling our story. And it helps us to define our story by asking, quite frankly, why should anyone even care about the story? Why should anyone listen to your story? If you can answer that question, you would be able to find a compelling reason to tell your story. And through that, you also begin to craft an engaging story. The why question can also help us to connect to the emotion of the story beyond just the facts. And I'm going to tell you quite frankly, as journalists, we are very good at shutting off emotion because we are there for facts. It's not that we do not listen for emotion, but very often we listen more for facts. But here's the thing, people are drawn to stories about other people. If you can humanize the story with emotion and talk about why it's important also on an emotional level and how it makes people feel, you could end up with a story that has wider reach and impact. So, in so instead of telling the story only of what you did, also tell the story of why it matters to other people. Now, I want to say if there are people on this group who work for any associations, or organizations, I think it's important, you know, to understand that journalists are coming in and sometimes not all of them will understand you or understand your story or even understand your why or even agree with your why. Do please just refrain from trying to force a journalist to write what you want them to write. It's so, it's just gonna not, it's not gonna work out well. That's all I could say. It's just not gonna work out well, you know? There's nothing worse than being pushy, and this could actually create a negative impression and journalists might start wondering whether you have an alternative agenda or if you're hiding something. You know, journalists, you know, they, they get onto something and <laughs> they have their own ideas sometimes. So, of course, all of this is in the realm of news journalism. You can apply the same journalistic principles to your social media posts. The great thing about social media is that it is a way to publish stories that the mainstream media ignores. 
you know the mainstream media is prioritizing a whole bunch of stuff there's politics crime education sport you know entertainment there's all these other things that their priorities above religion stories even though religion intersects with so much of who we are and so much of what we do we see that all the time i mean the big story like i mentioned at the start of the presentation right now is women's rights to an abortion you know what's the pushback where is it coming from this definitely a religion angle there, you know so even though religion intersects with a lot of what is happening in society it is not always viewed as newsworthy now another reason why journalists largely avoid religion reporting is because the secular mainstream media largely views religion you know as something that is personal and it doesn't interfere it shouldn't interfere with secular affairs and how we run our societies and our governments and it should you know people are like government and society in the public facing space should be secular and faith-based matters are for your personal you know like what you do in your personal life and yet we know it's not like that we know there's a lot of public faith events and, and, and just people who follow a religion who are in the faith or in the public sector. So it's of course not to say that all media ignores religion. Around various religious celebrations or important dates such as Easter, Christmas, Diwali, Rosh Hashanah, Ramadan and Eid, there's often some form of acknowledgement of this time in some of the mainstream media. This can take various forms, including a, a simple congratulatory message or an article with more information and photos explaining what the celebration or festival means to faith adherents. In the mainstream media and on social media, there's still plenty of space for storytelling and dialogue about religion. I really believe this. And that's because, like I said, I'm repeating it again and again. I feel like I'm repeating myself. That's because religion is so much part of who we are. Religion is such a big part of many societies and many countries. Now, it's important to, to know that if you want to engage the media about a faith or a religious event, you know, it's important to know what media you want to approach and who the relevant journalists are that focus on religion or would be inclined to do so. So you need to do a bit of research. You need to be listening to the radio stations, looking at the TV stations, looking at the newspapers, do your research because, you know, you don't want to contact a, um, you know, a publication or a or radio station that's focusing on, let's say, gardening and tell them, oh, do you want to write about Eid? Do you want to write about my, you know, my church bazaar or something? I don't know. Like, it's just not a good fit. And you're going to save yourself a lot of time, you know, when you go and you find the right um, media outlet for your story. There are people who want to tell your story. You need to build those relationships with the right journalists. Invite them to your events. They might not come the first time or the second time. They might come the third time. But build relationships with the journalists. Keep them updated, you know. Um, and yeah, so that that is absolutely important. Going to the right media outlet and finding the relevant journalists. Now, another option, of course, is to write the story yourself. Write the story or the column yourself and send it to a media outlet. It's important, you know, that, of course, once again, you've done your research, you look at where this could be published, or which radio station or TV channel would be interested in it. And, um, you know, like, it's, it's really about keeping them updated more than anything about your projects and, you know, because they want news. They want to know what's happening. They don't want to sort of like just have a random story like this is an introduction to Islam or Christianity or Judaism or you know Native American faith or African traditional religions they want to know what's happening tell me what's the news you know so yeah and you know there have also been certain interventions so as I mentioned earlier the global exchange on religion and society is actually a, a European Union project where they are bringing together journalists and and civil society organizations that focus on faith-based issues because they see a need for that space because the media is not going to take the initiative frankly speaking i've said it you know the journalists are busy with all the other kind of stories religion is kind of like lost on the list it's kind of like oh people are starting to fast tomorrow we need to put a picture on the front page about people sighting the moon and or like oh it's christmas tomorrow let's put a picture of father christmas on the front page you know that's how religion often is framed in the newsrooms um, and so this intervention aims to bring together people to start talking about how can we get more religion stories or stories about faith. And I like to use the word faith because it's more encompassing. 
you know, religion has a very kind of like specific dogmatic kind of way that people think about it. But faith, it's more inclusive to bring in alternative faiths as well. Now, in closing, you know, I just want to also say that when you're reaching out to journalists, it's that, you know, that thing we've heard it many times, just keep it simple. Journalists don't speak your language always. Journalists are not theologians. This came up in my conversation, in fact, with Stephanie, when we were planning this event, you know. Stephanie was like, you know, journalists are not theologians. She knows journalists quite personally, I might add. <laughs> and, you know, journalists, quite frankly speaking, we don't know every one of the Ten Commandments or the names of every Hindu deity. We don't. So help journalists to understand your religion by using easy to understand language. Break down complex beliefs into language of the everyday. This is after all what we as journalists do for a living. We try to explain complex ideas to just about anyone. This is saying that we say, you need to be able to tell this to your granny and she needs to get it, you know? So remember, keep it simple because that can be so much more effective. So yeah, that's the end of the presentation. I'm gonna stop this, the screen share and then we can see who's online and we can take some questions and yeah. Thank you so much, Yazid. Um, I just wanted to start off with a, a question that might get a little bit more at your personal vocation, because as, as you gestured toward, I am married to a reporter. And so I have a lot of these conversations in our home over dinner. And something that he and I speak about a lot um, is the intersections between which your, your career currently, I think, is embedded in is between journalism and activism. And I mean that in the sense that you've chosen to go into a program about peace building. You've decided to take your skill set and apply it very specifically within what a lot of people would consider an activist setting. And as you know, I'm sure from journalistic ethics, there's a lot of question marks around uh, where that line is. Uh, it moves, unfortunately, it is a moving target a lot of the time. Um, but I would love if you would speak a little bit more towards how you kind of found yourself from going from pure reporter to a little bit more of a peace builder and what that has meant for you in your vocation. I'll unmute, sorry. Stephanie, um, I, I was very careful. I said, you know a journalist <laughs> quite well. I didn't want to say it's your husband, <laughs> but you did it. <laughs> um, I've always been so cautious of not being called an activist because immediately it implies that I'm coming with a particular agenda, that I'm speaking for an organization, or that you know I'm not going to do my job with neutrality or like I'm going to have bias, right? So for me, Essentially, what I'm doing is I'm saying that I want to be more conscious. And this is what I think more journalists also need to be. We need to be more conscious of the impact of our reporting. Because when we say that we are writing about an, an other group or another religion or a conflict, we need to consider the impact of the articles. And we've seen a lot of irresponsible journalism. We've seen a lot of journalism that actually fuels conflict. Now, I'm not saying I'm interested in peace journalism. I am interested in peace building, and I do know that journalism can play a role in peace building because so much of it that we've seen, you know, the misinformation, the blatant, uh, just even borderline hate speech, you know, that we've seen online, whether it's on a blog, in, in a very, you know, respectable newspaper or TV station sometimes even. And, and I mean, the U.S. has many examples of that, you know, and not just these, but many places. I don't want to pick on the U.S., but I mean, I'm here now. So, you know, I'm just reflecting on where I am. We, we have journalists who perpetuate with its stereotypes, with its hatred. So I'm, I'm not kind of going into, I'm taking the peace building into my journalism in a way where I'm saying, I'm going to be more responsible. And that's something that I've been, a part that I've been on, you know, especially with the International Association for Religion Journalists, where we have consciously said, we have a responsibility to our readers and to our audience and to society to do journalism ethically and fairly. And, and you know, like adding this layer of responsibility towards peace building is, it's a personal choice as well, you know, like, I mean, other people could just be like, no, I want to just, 
get the headline. You know, I want to do this for the ratings. And people love conflict, right? People love, you know, disaster. It's so sad. It's so sad. But that's the kind of stuff that sells, unfortunately. That's a, I, I mean, it's a great observation. I think something that I would also, I would also be interested in you speaking toward is, so is it just the, the way in which you, you are aware and you um, do your best to speak correctly and speak non, um, bi with, without bias? Um, is it also in choosing the people with whom you are in dialogue? Because I was really fascinated with you used, uh, I think this was a, perhaps a, a methodology that your paper used, but the voice of the people. I, of course, as a theologian was like, hey, <laughs> I, I know that. Um, so it, in my tradition, I, I come out of Roman Catholicism and liberation theology in particular. So the voice of the people, the voice of the marginalized, of course, being central to that theology. And so I felt a connection with what your goal was with going to those people. So I was just interested with all the traveling you've done with kind of what you're thinking about engaging with next. Is it not just how you speak, but who you're speaking to? Um, if you would talk to us a little bit about that process from a journalist perspective, because I think for those of us who might sit in higher education or in our um, church or temple, it's we might not understand when the person calls and, and what they're kind of looking for or asking for. So how do you talk to the people? Mm -hmm. Well, I think what's super important is, you know, when you go through this kind of experience that I've just had with HIU, the um, master's program in international peace building, you definitely grow a deeper appreciation for diversity. And in fact, we've just had a, a, a session. Today's such a busy day. I've just come out of a, a coffee session with the program director and classmates, and we were reflecting on the journey. And you know, the group that I was in, we sort of like drew these lines where we all came in, and it was like a, you know, these straight lines coming in. And then it was lots and lots of squigglies and lots of things going on. And then we're all exiting again at the other end of this sort of like experience and you know i think journalists need to become more familiar with the diversity around them because that can improve the reporting and an added layer is for me at least coming into a space where i've got tons of experience reporting on conflict understanding conflict a bit better and this is something where i think journalists need to brush up on so for example we've you talked about methodologies and we have tools you know, there are new tools that I'm going to add now to my journalism kit. And that is how do I understand it and pack conflict? Because that helps me to understand the story better. For example, we always talk about voices in our stories, and those are our sources. So if I use certain frameworks to understand conflict, I can understand, okay, this is the story and this is how it's developing. And these are the people that I need to speak to to adequately reflect the reality or the truth, as we call it. So I would say that I've gained quite a number of new uh, methodologies and tools and ways of looking at conflict and peace building, in fact, um, and that can only enhance my journalism and my goal, you know, to do better journalism that creates more stable societies. We always talk about journalism being the fourth pillar of democracy. We always talk about it being the fourth estate. And I really believe that. I really believe that public opinion can influence the behavior of people. Yeah, I love that. So I live in Maine, north of Massachusetts, really, um, for the most part, it's changing, but it's a pretty monoculture uh, state, it's very small in population. But something that's been really wonderful that I've seen um, happen is we are starting to see language groups across uh, like new Congolese immigrants and old Quebecois, um, so all French speaking coming together and they're actually like um, when you were like hey it's an iftar in a catholic church um there are these language groups that are happening in the mosque um or these language groups that are happening in churches and so i took that kind of observation of these ways that we are socially religious um i take that to heart because i think that often as potentially some of us on this call might be more on the theology side and sometimes as theologians I, 
I almost find it sadly easy to forget social religion, that there are life ways that might be accessible to a journalist that we don't think to share because for us, it's so embedded in our personal belief system or so embedded in our theology that we don't even think, oh, this is simply sharing a meal. This is simply sharing a language and that's something anyone could access. And so I was really, um, I'd love if you would speak a little bit more to how, when we reach out potentially to journalists to say, hey, we're having, like you were saying, a bazaar, we're having an Eid, an open, you know, celebration. Um, what are some things that you want us to emphasize? I, I remember the news. I'm supposed to go with what's happening, <laughs> which is always something, you know, non-journalists forget. It's like, no, we can't just say generally what Christians are thinking. It has to, ha something has to be happening. <laughs> so we hook up with what's happening. And then what else? What can help me pick up the phone so I'm not scared to invite a journalist into my community? Thank you for that question. So just also to say that um, the uh, diversity with a rather encountering diversity for some people is still a new thing, right? Um, and that is because of how societies change and develop, like you're saying, your community or your where you are, you know, there's some change happening. And you know, there's, you know, people, you know, how do I say this? If that if what we call a third space for interaction and interfaith dialogue is not curated, and this is something that we talked about in one of our courses here on this program, um, it was an introduction to interreligious dialogue. Um, one can see tension and conflict happening in that environment. If a third space is not curated for people to come together and have interfaith dialogue and understanding. Um, and the reason I say this is because, you know, I once traveled to Ethiopia and um, I spoke to the person who was like my tour guide. And I said, listen, um, you know, I'd like to eat meat, but I'd like to find halal meat because I knew that Ethiopia is kind of like 50 50 with Muslim Christians. So he finds a place for me and I buy the food and I want to share the food with him. And he says to me, I'm Christian. I can't eat halal food. I said, oh, I didn't know that. But then I said to him, you know, you're not going to become Muslim if you eat halal food. It's about encountering diversity and creating opportunities. And the media is such a big, oh, the media is a, an influential sp space as well. So we need to look at how we can use the media, you know, as a third space to encourage diverse and appreciation and acceptance of diversity and this interfaith uh, work that we would like to do. Now, when you communicate your story, the why question is always important. Why is this event important? important? So you could, in Maine, for example, have an interfaith um, event, you know, where it is about, um, it doesn't even have to necessarily be about one particular faith celebration. It could be for the sole purpose of having the interfaith experience. And you could say to the journalists, we are having this because we want, you know, our communities to know each other, we want people to know each other. The why question is super important. And then, of course, there's the what is happening, where is it happening, and when is it happening, which is all the, like, you know, basic stuff. But I think that why question is so important because journalists want to write, you would like journalists to write about what you're doing or report with so TV, radio, you know, print. And if they can understand the value of the story, if they can see the newsworthiness of it, they are more likely to come and, you know, to write about it. Thank you so much. I think that's a really great observation. The um, I think the third space phrase is something that's hit me in, in my core because something that um, I'm seeing also in my particular interfaith um, you know, work is we're actually creating a third space in crisis response, which is sad to say just about the state of our world, but also I could see also journalism providing a way for us to do that work better. So if we, for example, again, we received many refugees from Afghanistan and that was an interfaith effort. How could we have done that better had we utilized the third space of uh, journalism to just say not only what's happening, but that there is a bigger why to that. And I think the why right there is encouraging diversity in a changing society and being able to have people uh, like to your point about fear, 
to demystify people. And so then the fear goes down. And that's something that journalists have access to that those of us just in our own faith communities might not necessarily have that kind of platform. You know, faith spaces itself is a place where we can have uh, a third space. So religious and faith-based communities have often been able to bring people together. And that's why the interfaith work is so important, where faith-based communities or people in the religious spaces, you know, create space for dialogue and interaction. The other important thing is that we, we also need to understand how, for example, migration impacts on a local community. You know, like what are the fears? Can we begin talking about that? Can we create a space for that conversation? Because I can tell you in South Africa, we do have unfortunately high levels of xenophobia targeted against black Africans who come to live in our country because the majority of them live in townships, which are um, very poor you know, areas. So there's like almost, they become easy targets for crime, for criminals, right? And there's also a situation where people are feeling an impact. We need to understand that impact. You know, it's not just about, nobody is managing that, what's happening on the ground. You know, we have many immigrants coming into South Africa, whether it's legally or illegally all the time. But do we understand the impact that it is having, you know, in the, in, 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 on the ground and how that and why that is leading to xenophobia? I'm not placing blame, but I'm saying, let us begin to understand, you know, immigration better, as opposed to saying, this is a very black and white situation. We have people who hate other people and they're killing them. You know, um, I can only imagine what it must be like also for an immigrant. I mean, the Afghanis who are coming to Maine, we've got some Afghanis who are now resettling here in Hartford as well. And one can only begin to imagine their experience and concerns, you know. So these are all stories, you know, that I think the journalists can write about and cover to be able to, you know, create conversation and dialogue about the diversity in our society. By the way, are we taking any questions? Because I see a couple of familiar names on this, um, yeah. on this chat. I see, you know, I see Mehmet Kilic. He's the president of the Journalists and Writers Foundation. I just did an event with him yesterday where we linked up with a journalist in Ukraine and a, a journalist in Turkey. I see Phoebe Milliken, she's the director of the program that I'm studying. Um, yeah. I also see my classmate, Abdul Wahab Mujai. Hello, Phoebe. Hi, and hello, Mehmet. Hi, hello. It's so nice to have you guys here. I also see Abdul Wahab. He's my housemate. I live in the same house with this guy. And then my other classmate, Becky Yunana, sent a message in the chat, and she was just thanking for the, for the talk. Should we open up for questions? Yes. Or comments, please. observations? Share, please. Anyone? I've been greedy. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, so Yazid, I was interested, you were saying earlier, and I logged in a few minutes late, so I missed the first few minutes, one of the first things I heard you say is, you know, you can't force journalists to write what you want them to write. Now, if we encounter journalists who we think are approaching us with biases, maybe biases they don't know they hold, how do you recommend you approach that with people so that you think that what they're reporting is, in fact, fair and ethical because uh, and get around those biases that is very challenging <laughs> the unfortunate thing is that some journalists and some media outlets they just take a stand you know they just for example i mean i'm looking at some of the coverage coming out now on you know the um the abortion debate in the u.s and these some media outlets have a very particular stand on it. They take a very strong anti or pro stand. And I feel like sometimes with those kind of media, the best way would be to counteract it by going to other media, because unfortunately, there are some media who are very set on whether it's a political view or a religious view. Um, I also do think, though, that engagement is important. So engaging with journalists, writing to the editors, speaking to uh, direct to the media, you know, um, is, is, I guess, is the first thing to do. Um, but there is definitely, you know, a, a challenge in working with journalists and media outlets who have a very particular agenda and stand. It's very challenging. I mean, I've seen that in South Africa as well, where we have certain journalists or certain media outlets right now because of the ownership 
influences the journalistic voice. And that's so unfortunate that it's happening because it's the first time really that we're beginning to see that in South Africa where one particular media owner is influencing, you know, the way journalism is done at that company. But the, the, the first thing would be, you know, is I guess to write to those editors and journalists and invite them again and say, listen, um, I feel that you have a bias, you know, can we talk about this? Um, and, and that's that's bringing in the peace building skills, right? That's bringing in the stuff that we've been doing over the last while. Um, and if, you know, if that doesn't work, unfortunately, you know, there are, well, fortunately, there are other media outlets as well. And there's always going to be, you know, space. And like I said, tell your own story, go to social media, get your story out there. Thank you for that very challenging question. I'm super awake now. That was like coffee. <laughs> Thank you for your answer. I appreciate it. And I see Mehmet has raised his hand. <clears throat> Hi, Yazid and everybody. Uh, uh, it's great to be with you. And Yazid, you're doing a phenomenal job. And we had an amazing panel discussion yesterday on press freedom uh, with journalists from, from the US, Ukraine, Belgium, and uh, uh, Sweden, sorry, right? And South Africa. So uh, 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 when I think about peace building and journalism, and many people think about peace building a word that is more affiliated with the United Nations with peace building operations, and it is more on <laughs> conflicts and wars. Uh, yes, uh, you know, journalists are in the field uh, to cover stories in uh, conflict zones or war zones. And we had one journalist, Isabel from Ukraine, she was reporting from there. But uh, when, uh, you know, think, I think about peace building uh, because uh, as the journalist and writers foundation, uh, building, uh, peaceful and inclusive societies is one of our mission, right? So peace building is not only about conflicts and wars far away from like conflict zones, but it's within our society. Uh, so that's why uh, I think journalists, they have, uh, you know, a role uh, to, to build peaceful and inclusive society within our society, not far away, but right in our society. So when I, uh, and since we have this journalism, media and communications webinars with uh, journalism students, we talked about, uh, you know, uh, media ethics, right? Journalism ethics. And I believe that some part of this uh, peace building or like responsible journalism is covered in media ethics. But do you think that uh, uh, this peace building uh, piece should be embedded or included in the, uh, you know, uh, the journalism students uh, curriculum? Or for example, when you had your uh, studies, do you like? Do you remember peace building was taught or mentioned? So how do you think you know we can uh, you know integrate peace building uh, into a curriculum? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Mehmet. So Mehmet is the president of the Journalists and Writers Foundation, and this is probably a conversation you and I are meeting today at one thirty. We could probably talk about this as well. How we because the next thing is one of the programs that I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be working with JWF and student journalists. Now, here's the thing, Mehmet, we don't necessarily call it peace. We don't call it, we are promoting peace, um, you know, as journalists, but we do have a real interest in uh, sort of uh, understanding society and reflecting back to society and what's happening. It's maybe not as clear cut as saying that we are there to create peace, but we definitely do see ourselves as contributors towards stable societies. So as journalists, you know, unless it's like a clearly mischievous, intentional kind of reporting to stoke violence and conflict, which we have seen as well. I mean, we have examples in Africa where like radio stations were used in Rwanda to fuel, you know, tensions and conflict between the Tutsis and the Hutus. We have examples where the media has intentionally gone out and, you know, like spurred on people to act violently against others. But I think generally the feeling is that journalism aims to reflect back to society and ultimately contribute towards stable societies. We're not calling it peace. Um, peace journalism itself has had a bit of a bad reputation over the past few decades. It came out in the 60s and, you know, there was like this whole idea that there should be peace journalism, but it, it, it immediately indicates or speaks to a certain bias. Peace for who? And whose peace? And whose idea of peace? You know? Um, when there is a conflict, our job as storytellers is to make sure that we reflect both sides or multiple sides, you know, 
Um, earlier, I was talking about methodologies that we've been introduced to in this course about understanding conflict. I love going back to the nested theory of conflict all the time because it's something that I see so applicable in my journalism. The nested theory of conflict says, locate the conflict. When I locate the conflict as a journalist, I can understand the story, you know? So my job isn't really to go out there and be sort of like, you know, waving this white flag and saying, I'm here for peace. I'm essentially saying my journalism can play a role in creating stable societies. And in a way that's peace building, but I'm not explicitly saying I'm peace building. Yeah, well, thank you so much, uh, Yazid. I think that's important. I didn't think of uh, the other part of the coin that, you know, it could be, it could include bias, you know, calling it uh, peace journalism. But on the other hand, you know, like speaking with different people, you know, let's say I don't want to, you know, uh, focus on Ukraine, but, you know, they say, you know, like what we are hearing in Ukraine, you know, is it really what it is happening? Okay. On both sides. Okay. Because there are two sides, you know, like one side, the, the Russian side, there's, you know, using media to propagate to their, uh, you know, for people. And then there is another media that are trying to, you know, cover stories of what's happening there, right? So in that sense, you know, you know, you know, access to, you know, information or free flow of information is important. I think so that's what I meant, but I think you answered my question. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. I just want to acknowledge, oh, thanks, man, but I just want to acknowledge my mother just joined. <laughs> Mommy, please keep your video up. <laughs> oh, it's always good when our moms show up, right? Um, I love this. Um, I just wanted, what I think one last uh, question I have just to close us out is for you to look forward uh, with us. I would, you know, it's that time of year, end of the semester, end of the school year, end of the program for many of our students, uh, including you. Um, so tell me what you're up to, what you're thinking about, and also how you're discerning how this is all going to come together in your life going forward. Just a small question, just a little bit. Tell me your purpose. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think Phoebe will love this answer because she's probably here. So <laughs> to share that, um, I have taken on this as part of my new journey, or part of my journey, a new part of the journey. So I have an internship that I'm doing with um, the American Friends Service Committee. And the Quakers, right, the pacifist group, and um, they're based out in Philadelphia, but I'll be working remotely. I'll be working with them until the end of September. And then I've also got some uh, work that I'll be doing with Essential Partners, which is an organization based out in Boston. Um, you in Boston? No, you in Maine, sorry. Yeah. Um, and essentially, I'm going to be, the goal is to learn more about the field and gain more skills. And also I'll be doing a program with, um, with Mehmet, with students at Stony Brook University, hopefully. And it's going to be focusing um, sort of like on journalism. And so this work that I've been doing goes into the new spaces and the other spaces that I'm part of. It just strengthens the resolve to do journalism that creates more stable societies. So I don't know that, you know, I don't know if one day, I mean, I do have a capstone project as well, that I'm writing a proposal for. So life is busy, guys. Life is just so busy. Um, I've got a capstone. In fact, I'm meeting my academic advisor at 3 p.m. today. So <laughs> I'm talking about that. So the idea is to create this project proposal that could be that could be executed, that could be done in the world. Now, I don't know if I'm going to be a peace builder in, in the traditional sense of the word. I don't know if I'm going to eventually be someone who does dialogue facilitation or mediation. But this is a field that I'm, I'm, I'm walking on this path now, you know, I'm doing it. And it, like I, I, I said this before, it could be so easy to, you know, I said this to people before, it could be so easy for me just to go home and forget about all of this, you know, and just go on being a journalist again. But this is something that I feel I've been so deeply, you know, connected to and that I'm interested in and that I want to take with me. So, you know, like we were talking about this, like peace building isn't just in the Ukraine. It isn't just in the war zones. It's in the everyday fabric of our society, right? It's in Maine where there are immigrants and, and local populations. It's in New York where there's, you know, um, issues around housing or in the States right now where people are talking about 
the right to abortion. Um, peace building is, is like all around us. Thank you so much. Um, and I've just gotten so much out of this conversation. And I thank you so much for your generosity. Um, we've gotten practical tips. We've gotten more philosophical. Um, it's just been a really wonderful uh, conversation. And I thank you so much for your willingness to share. And thank you all for coming. Um, on behalf of the BTI, thank you for another wonderful uh, session of BTI Talks. And we will see you all again in the new school year. Thank you, Yazid. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. And thank you to everyone.